MIT has always been driven by the quest to innovate, gain new knowledge, and solve hard problems. And in the last century in Cambridge, the Institute has literally helped transform the future of everything from the fields of science and engineering to arts and social sciences. Not one to rest on its reputation, though, MIT is laying the groundwork for its second century in Cambridge with bold initiatives on campus, in the community, and far beyond. Right now, MIT is feeling a huge sense of optimism because we can see the potential in all of the things that we're doing. We can see the opportunity to build off of this platform and have real impact in the world. To kind of open up a new chapter of 100 years today, you can see lots of possibilities for impacting the world and our local community in a very positive way. I think it's the most exciting time to be at a place like MIT. A hundred years ago, the decision was made to create this tremendous campus to be a presence, not just in Boston, but in Massachusetts, in the nation, in the world. You just have to respect and admire the people who had such a bold vision. What's important right now is to think of the bold decision for the next 100 years. Nanotechnology is a fundamental discipline in delivering the next set of innovations for the 21st century. As a result, it will affect the way we think about life sciences and medicine. It will allow us to come up with new energy paradigms, new energy devices and structures and physical processes. It will allow us to understand how to make better construction materials and hence make more sustainable world. It was really a grassroots effort of going out and talking to people around the Institute about the tools they needed to take their research to the next level. And we got an overwhelming response that small was the next big thing. The MIT Nano is the biggest maker space that the planet will have. We're going to be able to go all the way from manipulating atoms and creating new kinds of bacterial behavior to, say, using technology like 3D printing to come up with products or parts. If you guys could do me a favor and just grab a hard hat, uh, the backs are all adjustable. And then what we're going to do is make our way onto the site and we're going to stay close together. One of the hardest things about building MIT Nano is the fact that the construction site is surrounded by thousands of windows. As a result, they're always being observed. Observed by just curious minds, people who really want to see and marvel at what is happening in front of their eyes. You guys want to go down? Let's go down. And it's going to be very muddy down here, so. We brought a group of civil engineering graduate students to see what's happening on a real construction site on campus. The challenges, the innovations that are going on, and it's great for our students to get out of the classroom and get out into the field. One of the things that we needed to do to meet their performance requirements of the program was find the quietest site with the least amount of vibration uh, and EMI interference on campus. We had five locations that we looked at early on and we did tests in all the locations uh, around the campus to see what was the highest performing site and it happened to be this one. It's far enough away from the T where the T wasn't interfering uh, with us, general traffic from vehicles and it was also great because it's located in the center of the main group. This is a shared use facility so there's going to be many programs that are going to utilize this building. There will be no faculty offices in this building. It's going to be a large shared tool. So it's great for the program, great for the school, horrible for construction. The only way to get to the site is to go under Building 39, under Building 37, or off of Mass Ave under another underpass. Just about the minimal clearance for a truck to go under. Every single piece of steel, every single clump of dirt, every single cement chunk needs to be passed through this one narrow alleyway. It's just a remarkable feat of engineering from perspective of constructing a building at such a hard to access site. It's like building a ship in a bottle. The heart of the building is the clean space. Clean space because, well, typical items we work with are nanoscale or micron scale in size. A dust particle is micron scale in size. So if you have a dusty environment, you will essentially have features 
bigger than your devices landing on your wafers that contain your devices. I need to give you imaging environments that are vibrationally very quiet. So the building is designed to have an extremely low vibration levels. Result of that is that you can have instruments inside it that can indeed allow you to image the nanoscale and also write down nanoscale features. With MIT Nano, we've generated a core right in the middle of that interconnected maze that brings people together. And this is important because this is who we are as a community. We interact and engage with each other across field and across discipline. MIT Nano epitomizes the next 100 years of MIT. I mean, I think it's very apt that MIT Nano is the first building for the next century of MIT campus. We moved out of Boston because it was too noisy and it was too dusty. Now, MIT Nano is reducing the noise and the dust for the 21st century advancements. The Nano Building is sort of a wormhole into the future. So it's going to be an important destination. It's, quite, it's going to be where we see the future, quite literally, and shape it. We are in the middle of the renovation of Building 2, and this project is essentially new classrooms, new offices, new teaching spaces. In addition to it, it's a full refurbishment and renovation and replacement of the environmental control, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, in such a way that we can now bring the math department into the current state of the art in terms of what they need for teaching, but also restore the integrity of the original architecture of Building 2. This is an interesting building because it was built almost 100 years ago and it hasn't really been renovated or changed in 100 years. This is a reinforced concrete frame, way ahead of its time. The first major use of a concrete frame in a building like this. And it's sitting on a forest of friction piles because this was originally filled. So fundamentally, the main group is floating. And it's all settling at a very, very small 30 seconds of an inch a year, but it's a big pancake. It's all the same. I'd love to say in a thousand years, this place is like the Parthenon, except it's not a ruin. How goes it? Good, good. The structure will last a thousand years, unless there's water or settlement or interventions that, are, that weren't planned for, you know, earthquakes or something like that. As long as you keep the water out, you're okay. I come through the building and I see a million things. <laughs> this is the original board formed, reinforced concrete structural column that was placed 100 years ago. And it's as good as the day they placed it. We are saving all of the original natural Monson black slate chalkboards, which are very, very difficult to buy anymore. If you're doing a lot of writing on a chalkboard, you want something that's frictionless. So the chalk just glides across this board. You can just write and write and write and you don't get tired. I walked through the renovation of the mathematics department very recently and you know just looked at all the names on the doors of uh, professors I knew and I thought of all the things that were going to be discovered. All the people that those people were going to run into in the halls. What these interactions of just proximity we're going to allow to happen. Here we are. It's amazing to be back in Building 2. As I think all of you know, it's a, just about the 100th anniversary of the construction of the main group, and it, it's great to be the vanguard of, of the renovation of the main group. Okay, now it's time to cut the cake. All the blackboards in the common spaces are in use already. I mean, people have, you know, they just love it. They've gravitated to it, and they, they uh, we're happy to be back. Kendall Square without MIT is a place, and Kendall Square with MIT is a destination. It's an attractor of talent. It's an attractor of ideas. 
If we have that innovation ecosystem, not only we have a place to move the ideas of our students and faculty into the world, but we also have ways to have that innovation ecosystem, that commercial activity that influences, that benefits society, feed back into MIT. So it's extremely important to me in the 21st century that MIT is surrounded by those companies that are creating the future. For many years, people would look at Kendall Square and kind of think, well, it's a park and ride. You'd leave the car, get on the T, and ride to Boston. Having grown up in Cambridge, I mean, I remember you'd take the train to Kendall Square on a Saturday, uh, and it was a ghost town. I mean, there was just nobody there. It was just sort of inconceivable that anything could happen there. What I think the Kendall Project allows is the opportunity to create something that will be a destination for not only our campus community, but also for the residents of Cambridge. I think it's gonna create a, a, a very vibrant community, uh, a vibrant community that has a mix of residences, office buildings, academic enterprises that interact and exchange ideas on a 24-7 basis. What we're trying to do with the Kendall Initiative is really open up the campus by creating the kinds of spaces that really invite people in. By bringing industry close to campus and enabling those collaborations, uh, we are hopefully enhancing the ability of that knowledge that's happening in our labs and classrooms to get out into the real world and actually solve real world problems. It's a large mixed-use project on the transportation spine in Kendall Square, so above and around the Kendall Square T-stops. These two sites really frame a gateway to MIT. This is a, a large office building that would have the MIT Museum as an anchor tenant at the lower portion of the building. And as part of that development, the two historic buildings would be renovated. It's clearly the technology innovation hub, but we also want it to be a place where people come to meet. If students are on the campus, can feel and taste it and touch it, they may think about, maybe this is where I want to go to school because it becomes a reality, because it's not this walled off place to them. We're thinking very hard about how we can make sure that it's a space that is inviting, is welcoming, and is enticing. To have an opportunity to bring residential right to Main Street here, to bring uh, the new graduate housing with new capacity right here on top of the T-stop, to mix that with innovation space, retail, and open space connections, really has the opportunity for us to make a dramatic change in what's happening in Kendall Square. So although there'll be great expansion and growth for the university, there will be housing provided for the community. And there will be amenities in terms of streetscape and sidewalks, and there'll be public open space, which will be available to the public just as if they were part of the MIT community. Residents, business people, developers, MIT, all sat at the table to talk about zoning and planning issues. The main campus was designed to enable collaboration to occur down the hallway in the corridors. And what we're doing today is still fostering those same principles, which is how can we create that interaction to essentially a city scale. It isn't just about the next couple of years, the next five years, even the next 20 years. It really is about what's the campus going to feel like, look like in the next 100 years. We're kind of reliving the dream a hundred years later, when the main group of MIT was envisioned to maximize connectivity and network of people. It's hard to overstate the importance of this campus in terms of its impact on society. It's also incredibly exciting to think about what will happen on this campus in the next century. One of the things that makes it so fun to be an MIT faculty member is to get to work with students who are inventing that new world. This is really the point where MIT is reaching out to the rest of the world and to leverage nanotechnology, biotechnology, and a range of other areas toward future applications. That's what we're going to see the MIT of the future as being. It's not just a place, uh, it's an experience. It's a network of people that will span the globe. In the future, I would like the president of MIT to be sitting here in this room and to say that those people at MIT at the time, 100 years ago, made a very bold decision to create probably the most dynamic innovation ecosystem between Kenta Square and MIT that the world has ever known. That there are many MIT-like people in the world who cannot be here, and how MIT had the vision to create a digital world of education that has no limits. 
If you look at where some of the biggest problems in the world are today, those represent some of the biggest opportunities. Health is an important area for us because of where we are, because of the biotech surrounding us. We're getting to the point where we can edit genes and using that knowledge then to be able to solve disease. The health of the planet. We don't have enough fresh water for more than 7 billion people. Similarly with the issue of food. Mitigating the effects of climate change, finding low carbon and carbon free energy sources that protect the environment, finding new materials that allow us to build these clean energy sources. Those are all areas in which MIT plans to make a significant contribution. People here are thinking about and driven by the future. Not just living in it, but actually defining it. That's our answer to things, is to explore, inquire, question, and not accept the status quo. Really the special thing about this place is that nothing is impossible here.